Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, a charm offensive. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg assures lawmakers he will cooperate with the antitrust probe. We'll have the latest on his trip to D.C. Plus, crack the code. Goldman Sachs' Marty Chavez says traders who can't code will become extinct. More of our interview. And Roku shares upended. The video streaming platform company sees a second sell rating. Pivotal Research calling the stock, quote, dramatically overvalued after the 2019 rally. But first, to our top story, Facebook has suspended tens of thousands of third-party apps that were using the company's developer tools as part of a review that Facebook started following the Cambridge Analytica privacy scandal from early 2018. The number of suspended apps was at 400 in August of 2018. Facebook stated in a blog post that not all of the apps were necessarily abusing or selling user data. In fact, many were not live when they were suspended. To discuss, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Naomi Nix, out of D.C. and here in San Francisco, Bloomberg Technologies' Kurt Wagner. Does the fact that they are closing down some of these apps show that Facebook is finally doing enough? Uh, I think that it's a little bit unclear if any of these apps were really that important or relevant. I think you probably would have heard about them if any of these were really big name apps that a lot of people used. But I do think it shows the follow through, right? Facebook came out in 2018 and said, hey, we're going to review all this stuff and we're going to take it seriously and actually see if we can find uh, any apps that are violating these policies. And now they're actually doing it. And that's a good thing, right? They didn't just say it. They're actually going out and, and following through. So by that standard, I think, you know, it's a good sign that they're at least uh, uh, stepping in the right direction. You know, Kurt, the timing is suspect because Zuckerberg was in D.C. this week. Yep. What came out of those meetings? Well, I think it's very clear that, uh, you know, he was there, I believe, three days, um, including today. But it's clear that he uh, wants people to know he's taking this regulation conversation seriously. We've been talking about it for a long time. There's so many different uh, areas of interest. There's the uh, antitrust stuff. There's Libra. Uh, there's content regulation and what's Facebook's role in, in kind of policing the Internet and its own site. And a lot of this has been done with him here in California in Menlo Park. And so to show up there have these meetings, I think, probably goes a long way just to show that he's taking it seriously and Facebook's taking it seriously, uh, which they want, of course, everyone to, to understand. Naomi, let me fold you into the conversation here. From the D.C. regulation point of view, how was Zuckerberg received? Well, in fact, a lot of lawmakers praised the CEO for coming down to meet with them. They said they had productive conversations with the CEO on a range of topics, whether it's privacy, whether it's election security, whether it's competition in the technology industry. Um, and so it seems like this was a good start for Mark Zuckerberg to kind of ease some of those tensions that we've seen over the last two years. I don't think it, it means that Facebook's off the hook here in Washington. I think lawmakers are still looking to uh, impose more regulations on the tech industry in general. And Naomi, does this show that Zuckerberg, Facebook, big tech is actually now finally starting to be proactive instead of reactive or on the defensive? We've seen uh, Mark Zuckerberg increasingly call for more global regulations governing issues like privacy, data portability, and the like. I think the question will become, you know, where does the rubber meet the road here? And will Facebook agree to the kinds of legislation and bills uh, that lawmakers intend on passing? And, and also, will lawmakers be able to come together? Will Republicans and Democrats really uh, be able to agree on a broad, um, you know, a broad sort of technology regulation framework? Kurt, of all of these issues that we've discussed, data privacy, antitrust, the list goes on. What was the most important this week? Well, I have to imagine that antitrust is, is a huge focus for Facebook in terms of properly framing this in the way they want to regulators because they are under investigation from multiple fronts right now. There's a ton of conversation around, uh, you know, big tech and, and is it too big? Is it too powerful? So of all those issues, I think, you know, the most important for Facebook has to be 
uh, getting across this message that one, we're not too big, and, and even if we are, there's benefits to that. That's kind of been their their uh, approach so far, is to say, here's why it's actually helpful that we're the size that we are. So I think that's got to be a top priority. Naomi, I, I laughed a little bit when a senator, Josh Hawley, said that if Zuckerberg was serious about data, he should sell off WhatsApp and Instagram. Any sort of real threats to breaking up Facebook here? Uh, I think we're a long ways off from that. You know, these antitrust probes being pursued uh, by the, you know, by the Federal Trade Commission take a long time. Uh, you know, they have researchers, they have lawyers poring over uh, the various business model and business practices of companies like Facebook. And so is it possible that we'll get to that point? Of course. Um, but it's really too early to tell at this point. Kurt, let's fold over and switch from antitrust to the elections because mm -hmm. arguably the 2020 elections is coming up. Has Facebook Zuckerberg done enough to show legislators that he's taking misinformation seriously? Yeah, I mean, they've been, they've been doing so much since 2016, and it comes out in different uh, uh, drips and, and drabs sometimes. But the big stuff is they've set up these new guidelines for uh, political advertisers that they have to go jump through more hoops in order to get their ads onto Facebook. There's a, a data archive of all those ads so that those of us on the outside can actually go in and check who's paying for this. And I think those are the types of things that, you know, these uh, uh, politicians wanted Facebook to do. And they're, they're showing that they're doing it. It just doesn't all happen immediately. So it's kind of one of those, what have you done for me lately? So I don't think this is the last we've heard from them before 2020. And he did meet with President Trump. Yes. Heard any ideas on maybe what was discussed? I don't know, but I can assume a few things just by knowing those two people. One, President Trump loves to talk about censorship and what the role that Facebook and Twitter sometimes play in, in deciding what stays up and comes down. I'm sure he probably had something to say about that. And then from a personal standpoint, Mark Zuckerberg cares a lot about immigration reform. And this has been something we've seen President Trump obviously be heavily involved in with the with the wall and talking about Mexico. And I'd be shocked if the, you know, Mark Zuckerberg didn't at least voice some of his probably displeasure with uh, what the administration's been doing. How fun it would be to be a fly on that wall. Yeah. Thank you to Bloomberg's Naomi Nix and Kurt Wagner. And coming up, climate change is changing the game for investors. We find out why next. This is Bloomberg. This week, we've seen big tech make commitments to combat climate change. Amazon said it would meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement 10 years early. And then Google announced a big corporate purchase of renewable energy. As we wrap up our Covering Climate Now week, we also look at those participating in bringing attention to the planet state. Across the globe, tens of thousands of protesters were out in force this Friday to demand action on climate change from governments, businesses, and big tech. In Seattle, Amazon workers walked out to stage a protest Friday, despite CEO Jeff Bezos making the pledge on Thursday that Amazon will be carbon neutral by 2040. But are investors paying attention? Joining me to discuss a corporate and investor approaches to climate change, it's Harvard Kennedy School of Government fellow Jesse Michael Keenan. Jesse, you join me from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Let me start on that news of the day about big tech, namely 1,500 employees from Amazon walking out. Is that a sign that corporations and, and some of these companies aren't doing enough? Yeah, I think it's a very positive sign. We've seen activism uh, uh, throughout the tech world uh, among employees and groups of employees, uh, self-organizing and bringing awareness in terms of uh, environmental and social governance issues. And I think that that's resonating uh, not just in the boardroom, but uh, among shareholders and investors themselves uh, who've been active uh, in pushing forward these issues, and I think in substantive ways. I think Amazon's uh, push to be carbon neutral leading into 2040, I think that is a significant contribution. I've said it even here before that there, I think we can all recognize that uh, their current logistics system and the way we're getting packages and the like is wholly unsustainable uh, if that's one of many components of their business model, of course. But I think it is a positive first step and, and, and I think we should uh, recognize that these employees are in fact having some positive uh, effect. Jesse, your latest article in Science Magazine is a must read and I quote you here when you say there is a technology arms race among 
climate services providers to develop and sort of understand the risks to different asset classes from climate change. I first have to ask, who are these climate service providers? Well, these climate services technology uh, um, companies uh, range. They, they're sometimes they're conglomerates of engineering firms. In other cases, they're startups. So we see right there in uh, Silicon Valley a number of key startup companies, uh, some of whom are bringing true innovation uh, and disciplined services um, that are consistent with scientific consensus. And others, I think, are much more experimental. And I think the question going forward, um, if we look at something like the Network for Greening the Financial System among central banks and a broad ambition of greening and browning asset classes, we need technology to be able to help us set those benchmarks for what is advancing climate change and, in fact, uh, what is pushing us in the, in the other direction. And I think what we need to be careful of is um, modes of transparency, quality control, and quality assurance about how these technologies are really driving these investment decisions. And I think we're caught right now at a very interesting moment where we want to support intellectual property, we want to support proprietary technologies through R&D, but at the same time we need to begin to question what's in some of these black box models because right now we have strong reason to believe that there's good actors, but there's certainly bad actors, and that's causing some problems in, in terms of market share and market development. So then, Jesse, what is your prescription for bringing more transparency to these black boxes? Well, I think the private uh, consumers and private sector consumers will bring, uh, they will determine for themselves the value of some of these services and products. But I think what is more concerning is uh, as we get into capital planning and long-term investment decisions in the public sector, uh, I think there's a couple of models going forward. If you think about pharma and you think about the extent to which um, we are uh, evaluate trade secrets uh, and, and, and think about the extent to which uh, th there's some mechanism in public process and in procurement uh, where we begin to validate these things. Some measure of this may be through peer review scholarship. Some of it may be through the convening of advisory boards. I think there's a lot of uh, predicate here for engaging uh, trade secrets and in, in really trying to get to a, uh, advancing quality control and quality assurance. So there is a model and I think we just need to take it more seriously. You mentioned green and brown investments. Is it as simple as energy and industrials in one category and better actors, if you will, in another category, or am I simplifying that too much? No, I think that's a little bit of a simplification, but I think it does speak to a very important point, which is really across all asset classes and across all sectors, um, there's varying degrees of activities um, that uh, fall along a range of green and brown. And over time, we will begin to benchmark those activities in, in terms of not only their carbon footprint, but I think uh, increasingly of concern among investors, their climate risk, both in terms of transitional risk, uh, but also in terms of physical risk. And we need technology to help us give us the empirical foundation for setting those benchmarks. So there really isn't a sector, there isn't an asset class that's immune from these considerations about measuring the impact, disclosing, and ultimately accounting for these impacts uh, in the balance sheets of companies, both public and private. Well, it is a must read on a climate intelligence arms race finally hitting the financial markets. That was Harvard Kennedy School of Government fellow Jesse Michael Keenan. Now, reverberations of the U.S.-China trade war are being felt all over the globe. The head of the Singapore-based e-commerce portal site, Zalingo, says that the current climate is affecting her supply chain as well as her plans to expand in the U.S. From the Milken Institute Asia Summit in Singapore, CEO Anjkiti Bose told Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin about her experiences. I think there is a tremendous impact on the supply chain and on the companies themselves because uh, uh, mainly what people feel is a sense of volatility. They don't know what is about to happen. And uh, for a lot of companies that have large sourcing teams in China or just work with a lot of agents in China, uh, they don't know if they should pull out completely, but they're all starting to think about building a diversified portfolio in sourcing, and that definitely affects our business uh, in a huge way. What's the biggest concern for them? 
and um, how are they repositioning? Yeah. I think the biggest concern for them is again just that they don't know how to price their products and the impact that uh, this might have on their margins. So the lack of visibility leads to uh, this tremendous lack of uh, planning in how they should be sourcing, what they should be sourcing for a market that's changing very fast. Uh, U.S. Uh, uh, consumers especially are uh, rapidly changing what they buy and from whom, from the traditional businesses to the digitally native brands. Uh, so everybody requires to plan a lot, at least six, 12 months in the future, which is impossible right now. You talk about the U.S. market. It is one market where you're expanding pretty aggressively. Tell us what the growth plan is for the U.S. market. So uh, we have uh, we have always been a company that has uh, been built out of Asia, but with huge global aspirations. 80% of the exports that go into the Western markets actually originate in Asia in some way. Uh, but 20% of the world's consumption of apparel actually happens in the United States. So we thought that this was an obvious opportunity to not just connect uh, Chinese manufacturers to brands and customers in the U.S., but also manufacturers in Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Indonesia to uh, to brands in the U.S. and uh, we started our sales efforts maybe nine weeks ago and the response has been tremendous already. Sustainability is a big issue yes. for, for companies right now. How is that playing out and what are you seeing? I think uh, sustainability is a word that gets thrown around a lot. It's really a spectrum, right? It begins from responsible manufacturing that you have uh, compliance at the factories uh, right up to are you recycling fabric, right up to are you using hemp and uh, you know a, 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 a biodegradable fabrics, uh, etc. So it's a spectrum and I think everything, it's going to take us baby steps before we get to a fully sustainable supply chain. Uh, but it is a huge trend and there's a lot of demand from brands to be uh, responsible if not fully sustainable already. And we are one of the very few companies that can actually fulfill that aspiration for brands because we have true transparency and visibility into exactly where the products came from. It's impossible for a non-tech enabled company that doesn't have software right where the pro fabric was made to be able to say that, you you know, no little children were harmed uh, in the manufacturing of that product or the environment was not harmed uh, while the fabric was made. So I think it's an incredible advantage to be tech enabled in the space right now today. That was the Lingo co-founder and CEO Ankiti Bose. And coming up, at a time when gaming addiction is becoming a real concern, one company is looking to bring esports to the high school. We discuss the trend next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. What does the future of esports look like? Play Versus says it starts well at the school. The company's recently announced a $50 million Series C round. Within the past 13 months, the company's raised $96 million to help bring esports to high schools across the country. For more on the company's high school expansion, let's bring in Play Versus CEO Delane Parnell. Delane, congrats on the funding and big, bold moves planning to expand to 50 states. How do you plan to tackle that? Well, we have an incredible team of 41 people uh, based in Santa Monica, California, and, and we're working pretty hard to make sure we're able to service all 50 states, including D.C., uh, with league and state championship play this upcoming fall season. Who are you partnering with on the gaming side in order to do this? So we have partnerships with top game publishers. Uh, in our last spring season, uh, we allow kids to participate in League of Legends, Rocket League, and Smite uh, for state championships. Um, this fall, we'll be able to offer similar games, and, and you know, throughout the school year, we'll announce a couple others. You know, Delane, I find it interesting that there are some state associations that are involved than others that aren't yet. Do you lobby? How do you make sure that those state associations know who you are and get involved? Yeah, great question. So we have a partnership with the National Federation of State High School Athletic Associations. For short, they go by the NFHS. Uh, what they do is write the plan rules and govern high school sports, and they've been doing so for the past 100 years, uh, operating essentially parallel to the NCAA. We have an exclusive partnership with them, uh, and because of that partnership, we actually have unfiltered access to the state associations and the state association leaders. So all state associations are very familiar with Play Versus, as well as esports.
Sports as we've helped educate them on um, the scene over the past two years or so. Um, it's, it's more of a matter of, of either interest from their membership and or um, just bandwidth to actually introduce a new sport or activity. And so uh, today, um, last October, we, we launched our first product seasons in five states. We quickly scaled that a few months later um, in our spring season to eight states. We're heading into our fall season with 15 states partnered. Uh, within those partner states, schools will compete statewide for a state championship endorsed by their state association. Uh, and the schools in other states will compete reasonably based on time zone. We've talked a lot about how technology in many ways can be isolating. Make the case for why esports in high school is better than throwing the kid out on the soccer field. Sure, I don't think that it's a case of better or worse. Um, ultimately, there are 16 million kids in high school today. Only 8 million actually participate in sports. Um, and that's because uh, sports aren't scalable, right? There's bo boys and girls teams, there's varsity, JV, and freshman structures. Uh, and then each team, depending on the sport, has different roster limitations. And so 8 million kids go without being able to participate in sports, although they may have the talent and the skills just because there isn't room. And so what eSports allows uh, those kids to do is have another opportunity to get involved in school, develop infinity for their school program, to uh, uh, find community, to improve their grades, to have motivation, and, and obviously with the rise of collegiate esports to uh, actually receive a scholarship to play at the next level um, or a STEM-related scholarship. Uh, and so there's a lot of attributes, many of the same attributes um, uh, that we find valuable in traditional sports that are available in esports, uh, and that's a great opportunity to get kids involved. Play versus CEO Delane Parnell. Thank you for joining me. All things esports. Thank you. Now I want to take a look at some of the top tech calls of the day. It's another cell reading for Roku. An analyst with Pivotal Research says he sees, quote, dramatically more competition emerging, which will likely drive the cost of over the top video streaming devices to zero. That drags shares down to their worst day in months, down more than 30% from a recent record close. In its note, Pivotal Research added that companies like Comcast have massive leverage that will make Roku's growth more difficult. And Google's price target was raised to $1,400 by Baird on cloud valuation. Analyst Colin Sebastian says his data shows that clouds, Google's cloud business is gaining more traction. He adds that Google cloud valuation has yet to be fully embedded in Alphabet shares. And meanwhile, Micron gets a target price boost to $65 a share at JP Morgan. Analyst Harlan Sur says pricing for NAND memory chips was, quote, better than our prior expectations. JP Morgan also sees strong trends for gaming products related to PCs and smartphones. And coming up, it is the ultimate test for Apple on the hardware side. Will a better camera and longer lasting battery be enough to get customers to buy the iPhone 11? We discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. Apple's latest iPhone models hit the stores Friday. This will be a test of whether better cameras and longer battery life will be enough to lure buyers ahead of a much bigger redesign next year. Long lines snaked around Apple's flagship on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan as people waited to get into the space, which has also been under renovation for two years and emerged Friday bigger and brighter. To discuss this and all of our other big top tech stories of the week, I'm joined by Wedbush analyst Dan Ives and also with us Bloomberg's 
Business Week's Max Chapkin. Max, first, let me bring you in here. Are really cameras and longer batteries enough to buy a phone for $1,000? It doesn't even have 5G? Well, a couple things here. I mean, they did lower the prices of, of, the, uh, of the sort of lower end phone by, by $50, so that, so that makes a difference. And, and you know, you have people who, who, are, who are sitting on iPhones that are getting kind of old. You know, people, people are, are, are looking to upgrade. And, you know, the, the last thing is we've had this kind of conversation around Apple new products for years. I mean, it feels like feels like the same kind of question gets raised year after year. Are they are they doing enough? Is there enough innovation? You know, almost since the time that Tim Cook uh, took over and what we've seen is you know consumers really like this product now now again at some point assumedly um, that that will kind of dry up, but it doesn't appear to have happened just yet. Dan, I love your uh, on the ground analysis of that Fifth Avenue store in your latest research. No, what does your analysis show you about demand? I mean, for someone that's been going there since the iPhone came out, in terms of the flagship Fifth Avenue store, lines are 70% bigger than a year ago, based on our analysis. And I think the enthusiasm you're seeing, you know, I think partially it's, it's the three cameras, it's the three lens technology, but it comes down to the math doesn't lie. 350 million iPhones are in a window of an upgrade opportunity. They have not upgraded in more than three years of a 900 million install base. That's why I continue to believe this, based on pre-order, based on everything we're seeing in the stores, this is something that's gonna continue to surprise the street. And I think this is fueling the engine for the bulls. Dan, late on Friday afternoon, there was a headline that crossed the Bloomberg terminal that said Apple was granted tariff exclusion on some Mac Pro parts. How much of this does or does not go into your models when you evaluate Apple? Yeah, I think if you look at this, yeah, the initial tariff, the one that already kicked in, that was basically a one to two percent hit to cost. So I think it's something where we continue to view as a rounding error, but I think it just shows as the drum roll goes into December 15th, I continue to believe the bar's worse than the bite when it comes to tariffs for Apple. Right now, even though they are the poster child for the U.S.-China UFC trade battle, I think this is something that's contained, but yet it's a 25 to 30 hour overhang on the stock. And I think that's something right now, this is good news, but right now it comes down to core demand. And I think right now, if you look at it, iPhone demand definitely trending ahead expectations. I think many bears are you know, scratching their heads as they pass the Fifth Avenue store. Well, Max, I want to switch from Apple demand over to Huawei because earlier this week, Huawei also came out with their new phone, the Mate 30. Now it has 5G, but because of tariffs, it doesn't have that updated Android software. Any indication on if that's enough? Yeah, I think no. I think the answer is it's not enough. And, and, and the reason I say that is because we have seen basically company after company uh, try to kind of roll their own operating system. Samsung has tried it. Uh, Microsoft has tried it. And, and, and right now there are basically two platforms that consumers um, seem to want to be on, which are Apple and, and Google's Android operating system. Now, I, I do think that Huawei doing this is, is important because it shows that they're not lying down. And I, and I think part of what's happening um, with this trade dispute is it's, it's a negotiation. And if Huawei is able to you know, continue to show that it's not going to be, you know, uh, bullied or, or hurt by the Trump administration, that, that probably helps, you know, China's overall negotiating position. It probably helps Huawei's overall fortune. But I don't think this is going to be a huge hit. And I, and I think the part of the reason I say that is because we don't even quite know exactly where they're going to sell it. I mean, kind of, it's a bit of a tell when, when they don't say exactly which countries it's going to be in, that, that, that they don't believe this is going to be a huge hit. Dan, does demand in China and Europe for Huawei offset the U.S. ban? Look, I think right now, I mean, that continues to sort of be the big question because what you're starting to see in terms of Huawei, especially in China, is there a pro-nationalistic, you know, sort of pro-Huawei buying going on? I continue to think that that's really been de minimis in terms of what we've seen. But it's something, you know, when you talk about some of the offensive moves of Huawei in terms of what they're doing, I think it just shows that their back's against the wall and they're going to try to look for ways to monetize it. But in terms of this initiative, you know, I have more confidence in the New York Jets offense and them being successful here. Dan, you value public companies all day long, so I want to get your thoughts on the recent IPO market. Larry Ellison of Oracle came out and called WeWork, quote, almost worthless. Your thoughts? 
I mean, it's hard to rationalize a business, and this is really the investor pushback, for every dollar of revenue, you lose 50 cents. And I think it comes down to that business model where you know you saw the pushback from the street, it's a black eye for them, and then I think it really comes down to they become the poster child for investors starting to wave the white flag in terms of what they're going to like and what they're not going to like in terms of the IPO market. And you've obviously had strength in Zoom and Beyond Me to many others, but I think this is where there was a demarcation line. I think you saw that loud and clear. That business model continues to be the issue for investors as well as some of the other governance issues that we saw. Max, push the story of WeWork forward for me. What's the biggest headwind in the coming months? Governance issues or financials? So, I mean, it's funny that, you know, people have been talking about these governance issues for, for a really long time, but there's there's nothing like, you know, a, an imminent IPO to kind of focus everybody and to get, you know, Larry Ellison or whoever to pay attention. Um, I, you know, I've been surprised. I mean, they have made quite a few changes. They do, they do seem to be taking this seriously, and you are seeing this conversation about, you know, doing another, uh, uh, some sort of private funding round or, or, or something in, in the interim and accepting a, a lower valuation. I, I think it's a bigger problem for SoftBank, frankly, than it is than it is for WeWork. I mean, if WeWork is worth a little bit less money than, than they wanted it to be, I mean, that's obviously not great for their employees or, 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 or Adam Newman, the CEO. But the real, the real problem here is for SoftBank, which is trying to raise this additional fund, you know, thanks to its track record of making private company investments. And, and WeWork is a bad look. I mean, they were, they were saying it was worth $47 billion, and now people are talking about $12 billion on the low end. So that's, that's quite a come down. Well, I'm demanding we go toe-to-toe -to -toe on all of this sell-side analyst conversations every Friday. Thank you. That was Wedbush analyst Dan Ives and Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chafkin. Thank you for joining me. Now, the role of technology, it's always changing in the world of trading, and humans are fighting to stay relevant and not lose their jobs to a computer. Goldman Sachs Securities Global Head Marty Chavez spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Shanali Bosick on how important coding is in the world of today. It's like writing an English sentence. <laughs> it's an important skill, and at the same time, most of us are not professional authors or novelists or journalists. Right? Right. Writing an English sentence is important. I would say the same thing about coding. Understanding the algorithmic way of approaching problems is really important for everybody to get. Actually writing code all day is something that probably relatively few people will do in their jobs on Wall Street. Now upon leaving Goldman Sachs, I know one of the things that you're doing is teaching a class at Stanford, your alma mater, on how software ate finance. It's the working title. What are you teaching? <laughs> teaching your students. What does this mean? So if I look back at my 25-year adventure, 26-year adventure on Wall Street, the short, short description of it is making money, capital, and risk programmable. And the way we program them is by giving them an API. So I'm one of those people who sees the future architecture of the financial system as being built around APIs. Which APIs are you producing? Which APIs are you consuming? And so that is an unstoppable trend. You said money being programmable. Money is programmable. Are you programmable. alluded to crypto? Um, so crypto is certainly the place where we all go, uh, digital, digital assets, and it is a kind of programmable money, but actually completely away from crypto, there's a number of companies that have been working on making money programmable. Uh, one of the extremely successful Silicon Valley companies, Stripe, this is what they do. They published a bunch of APIs. They really didn't even need much marketing or sales force. The uh, developers just saw these APIs and said, wow, I can, I can get all my payments to happen just by calling these APIs. Well, that's programmable payments. We've been doing the same thing at Goldman Sachs more broadly defined, not just money, but assets, liabilities, capital, and risk more generally. So we talked about payments going electronic, and we talked about trading going electronic. Yes. We use this example all the time about a trading desk at Goldman going from 500 people to three, right? Tell me, what do you think the role of a human is on a trading desk these days? If you're coming into a bank, what are the biggest skills that you could have? So there are certainly many kinds of manual activities that computers are just better at. 
And so if you're making markets in a collection of single stocks, computers are just really good at seeing across the universe of single stocks. At the same time, there are always things that human beings do that computers don't do. I don't see that actually really ever changing. What is happening and what may be accelerating is if you are insisting on doing the same activities and doing your job in the same way that you used to do it, that's not a stable career strategy. You need to constantly be evolving. But people with world-class risk judgments, people with world-class relationship skills who deeply understand the challenges of our clients, those people are only becoming more valuable. That was Goldman Sachs Securities Global Head Marty Chavez speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Shinali Basak. And coming up, operating in the shadows to catch digital vulnerabilities of some of the world's biggest companies. Think hacking is always illegal? We'll meet one hacker who is paid to expose weaknesses legally. This is Bloomberg. the final installment of Next Jobs, a mini documentary series where we look at the careers of the future. This week, Bloomberg's Aki Ito is digging deep into the life of a professional hacker. This is a classic Nissan Skyline. It might look like just another car. But owning one of these makes you an instant star among car enthusiasts. And this guy's so rich, he owns two of them. He affords these luxuries not by toiling away at a nine to five job like the rest of us, but by breaking into websites and getting paid for it. My name is Tommy DeVos and I'm a hacker. The businesses Tommy hacks are headquartered in cities like New York and San Francisco. But Tommy works out of suburban Virginia. All the hacking he does is legitimate. In arrangements called bug bounty programs, companies like Verizon and General Motors pay him to look for security holes in their systems so they can fix them before the bad guys get in. When you find one of the ones that you know is gonna be like five or $10,000 payout, it's just you can feel your heart racing faster and it's just like doing drugs. I don't want to go too into detail on with, uh, <laughs> comparison with that. <laughs> but that's just, you get that same sort of rush. For some time now, tech companies have employed legitimate hackers to test their systems. But over the last decade or so, bug bounty hunting has become much more organized, thanks to the emergence of websites that match freelance hackers with businesses. The prize money has now gotten big enough to make this an actual career. What's the most money you've made on a bug? A single report is $20,000. What about in a single day? A single day, uh, $160,000 in October of last year. And I think that only took three or four hours worth of actually working. So if you were to average it out, how many hours a week would you say you work? Five to 10. Five to ten hours a week. <laughs> and, and how much money have you earned over the last year? This year? $636,000. What do you think is the thing that makes you so good at it? Just the fact that I've been doing it for so long. I thought Tommy was going to be something like a lawyer or a doctor. Tommy was very, very smart. And he was so much ahead of everybody else in the class. In our classes, you could play on the computers when you finished all your work. I'd finish my work in 10 minutes and then just go play on the computer. It didn't take long for Tommy to fall in love with the internet. And one day, he stumbled into a chat room where people talked about their illegal hacks. They taught him their tricks, and he started hacking for fun. The first time he got caught was when he was in high school. He was expelled, spent a few weeks in juvenile detention, and was ordered to stay away from computers. But he didn't listen. We got into NASA computers, the US Courts, Department of Energy, 
anybody that had huge budgets that should have had secure systems, but didn't. And he was caught once again, but this time as an adult. The judge told me if I get arrested for computers again and come to his court, he was gonna give me life in prison. For most people, bug bounty hunting is still more of a side gig than their primary source of income. You get paid only when you're the first to report a bug, and even those payouts don't amount to very much. On one platform called HackerOne, the vast majority have earned less than $10,000 over time. But if you're really good, you can make a lot more. Out of HackerOne's 500,000 contributors, Tommy's among just six people who've earned more than a million dollars. As more and more of the world moves online, cyber attacks are only gonna grow in frequency, in sophistication, and the havoc that they'll wreak on our lives. And that means we're gonna need a lot more of the good kind of hackers, testing our systems to make sure we're safe. But Tommy won't pretend his motivations are all that noble. The fact that we're securing the internet, it's a nice side effect, but I do it for the money. That was Bloomberg's Aki Ito speaking to hacker Tommy DeVos in the last of our Next Jobs series. Still ahead, more of our exclusive interview with IBM CEO Ginny Rometty, what she's learned from running the over 100-year-old company. This is Bloomberg. Technology companies face the constant threat of change. Either keep up or get left behind. It's a lesson IBM CEO Ginny Rometty takes to heart running a tech company that's over 100 years old. Rometty recently explained how lessons learned over decades at IBM are key to driving the company forward. She talked to Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. I do think of myself as a steward. I mean, this is a 108 year old company. And I have been blessed to learn from many of the people that came before me. Um, so I don't answer that question lightly. And, and this company has had to be reinvented many times. It's something many other companies have yet to face. It's one thing to put out new products, but it is something else when the competitive landscape attacks your core business models and you have to develop a new one. Core business models are the most difficult thing to have to come to, to build a new one. Um, and so, I can just now start to reflect on a lot of this. And it's funny when people say, what have you learned? And I would say that one of the very first things is, be clear in your mind what does not change, what does not change. And so to me, what doesn't change is the purpose of the company. And so IBM's purpose has always been to be essential to the world in some way. So I've been really clear with my team what doesn't change. So kind of, that's really to me my first lesson was, be clear what the purpose is, because that is the core around what people do. The second thing, though, is then don't protect your past, though. Other than that, don't protect your past. And so in my time uh, today, 50% of IBM's 80 billion is new products and services within the last four to five years, 50%. So we have had to divest of $10 billion of commoditizing businesses, because if you don't, you don't have the fuel to reinvest in the new. We've done 60 acquisitions, and then most currently Red Hat that's in here. And the cloud is $20 billion. And so IBM today, you know, some people, want to, they'll ask me, or I'll kind of quiz, and I'll say, well, what percentage of IBM do you think is hardware? You can imagine the range I get. Today, it is 9%. Now an important 9% does very important things, but we are cloud, solutions, services, software. That's 90% of what IBM does. And so that idea of don't protect your past, because it, it has to enable you to move from those things. And then the third thing to me is you won't be, well, it may be a surprise to you because when people say, you know, there's a lot of talk about the portfolio. Like I just said, don't protect your past so you can build a new portfolio and new business models. But the third thing I learned, and I learned it the hard way, the, if a company's gonna change, 
you have got to change how work is done in the company. I, I would say one of my, my biggest, you could call it a, a, a mistake and a learning. You know, I could see the world changing so quickly. And, and as, as our clients can see this around them, new competitors, things happening faster, startups everywhere. And I would say to the team, go faster, go faster. And you know what I did? I succeeded in exhausting them. And, it, and I realized that unless leadership does something to change how work is done, they can't really work faster. You have to put in, and it's not like you're telling people a new process, but this new world, and, and I really, it, this applies to every industry. This is to me perhaps my largest lesson and gift to my colleagues or others who are in transformation. I say, look, you've got to start with, in this consumer world, everything you touch is so easy, they expect, the world expects it in everything, even if you do something complex. So that meant, for us, design thinking. We hired a 20,000 designers because, hey, if you're an engineering culture in particular, you build something that can handle all situations, but that's complex. You gotta start with what does the end user like and we'll make it wonderful and empathy and build from therein. That's design thinking. Then comes agile. Because if you don't do agile properly, you build a mess fast. Instead, you have to learn to get this right, then add more, add more. That's true agile. We have now 200,000 people working in agile. And then the next thing was co-location. And then it was new tools. And then it was new real estate. And then it was new ways to motivate people. Not an appraisal system. You're an A, a B, or a C, or a one, a two, or a three. We abolished all that. So that then freed people to work in a new way and understand. So that to me was the greatest learning of a transformation. That was part of our exclusive interview with IBM Chairman, President and CEO, Ginny Rometty. And you can see the full 30 minute conversation online. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.